Hi there, my name is Ron Rogers, and this presentation is titled, I Was Sure I Had Busted My DC-10 Simavel. Now, this I took as the first officer. Um, I never upgraded to captain on the DC-10 because they were essentially replaced by the 777 by the time that time came along. But I was first officer on a DC-10 checkride. And the person getting the check ride was a very senior captain. He had just six months to go. So, you know, this should have been a piece of cake. We should have just coasted on this. Now, as a crew member, either, either a second officer or a co-pilot, you are really dependent upon the captain during a simulator uh, proficiency check type of evaluation. If they run a good crew, handle the emergency well, coordinate everything, have good cockpit resource management. It is just a pleasure to work with them. And I had a few captains I took check rides and they taught me a lot. And it was truly uh, a pleasure to take a check ride with them if, if such a thing can be said about check rides. But this check ride kind of became interesting. Let me put it that way. Now, like I said, this was a very senior captain and we were going to have a check ride. Okay, fine. No problem whatsoever. Well, on a typical proficiency check like this, it's a three day event and you lead it up with some recurrent training and you get in the simulator and you kind of get used to it and you do various maneuvers and stuff like that. And it was all going well, you know, no problem whatsoever. And then we're out in front of the scheduling board and he looks at it and he turns to me and he says, do you know who we have for our line, uh, for our PC? And I go, I look at the name and I go, no. And the look of terror on his face, we have such and such. And I don't even remember the guy's name. And, and as far as I knew, uh, the guy had no reputation, but according to this captain, this guy was absolute hammer. I mean, he was death waiting for us. So, you know, I'd never seen a guy turn so nervous. He's got six months to go. You know, most people have enough sick leave they could float through that last six months if things don't go well. All right, so we get in the simulator, and we've got a bunch of maneuvers we're going to go through. It's not like it later became the line-oriented flight training, loft training, where you fly a scenario. This was a, this was a series of uh, maneuvers. So uh, we start out with a normal takeoff. And it was fairly apparent to me that the uh, instructor wanted us to abort on this because um, we're going down the runway. Now you have a series of speeds. Uh, V1 is the abort speed. If you're below V1 and you have a problem, you abort. If you're above V1, you continue. You go up to VR rotation speed. And then V2 is safely airborne speed. That's the speed you're going for. So, you know, the airplane's going to fly for you very nicely. So, we're going down the runway. I haven't called V1 yet. We're 10 knots below it and we get an engine failure and the captain doesn't abort and he just continues and he calls out. He's continuing. And of course we lost an engine. So, and we're heavyweight. So it's kind of slow. And then I call V1. Well, okay. A little bit later I call VR rotate and then it's V2 and we take off. And then the uh, instructor says, well, Let's go back and do that again. Okay, I kind of expected that. So this time, the engine fails 20 knots below V1, and he aborts. Okay, that's good. So now we're going down the runway. We're setting this up again, and um, we get um, a engine failure after V1, and we start to drift to the right. You need to put in left rudder. We're drifting to the right, and I go... Center line correction, correct to the left, correct to the left. And we go off the right side of the runway. Now, the nice thing about simulators, I guess they don't know that you're crunching landing lights or all sorts of nasty stuff that's off the side of the runway. And it just continues flying and we get airborne and away we go. Oh, and I should mention on the other uh, procedure where we didn't abort 10 knots below V1, uh, we ran off the end of the runway on that one before we came airborne. So I'm going, oh my gosh, this, this isn't looking good. And I'm, I'm kind of sweating it here because if the captain fails, the whole crew fails. And I did not really want a failure on my record. Well, now we're coming around and we're doing uh, non-precision approaches. And well, these were set up at the time where you did what was known as dive and drive. You went down to the minimum descent altitude and then you drove level until you got to the point where you could see the runway and you made a normal descent. Well, there 
were a number of accidents where people were were diving, uh, but they weren't doing the driving part. They just dived right into the ground. And Boeing did a presentation at one of the safety conferences, and they uh, they showed you know uh, accidents during very various phases of flight. And one of them <clears throat> was uh, the fact that. Uh, some aircraft were crashing short of the runway because they drove right through the uh, minimum descent altitude right into the ground. So, of course, uh, the Boeing engineer said, well, of course, the solution for that is we need to move the runway about 1.7 miles closer in. Of course, that got a little bit of a chuckle. Uh, but anyway, we're coming down towards the uh, minimum descent altitude, and I'm calling 200 feet above MDA, 100 feet above. I'm calling MDA, and we just drive right through it. And I call below MDA, no runway in sight. We need to go around. We need to go around. We need to do the missed approach. Okay, he comes in, we do a missed approach. Well, okay, I'm thinking we had, mm, we got a good number of bus here on the check ride. Okay, well, we go back around, we do another one. This time, I'm a little stronger on the call offs. So we level off, we drive in at the MDA, see the runway, come in and land. And uh, we touch down, he goes, the uh, instructor in the back goes, check ride's over. And the captain and I kind of look at each other and it's like, oh crap. So we go in there, we're getting the debriefing, uh, except the debriefing hasn't started yet. We just sat down there and he's shuffling through some paperwork and writing a few things down. And uh, the captain says, well, are, are we going to have an oral? Because typically uh, that at the time you did the check ride first and then the oral. And if the check ride went well, the oral was probably, you know, fairly easy. If the check ride didn't go well, the oral could be very extensive. Well, Captain asks, are, are we going to do an oral? And the guy says, no, we don't need one. And then we look at each other and it's like, oh, crap, we busted. And he keeps writing the paperwork. And then the, uh, the instructor examiner looks up and he goes, what? And the captain says, well, uh, did we pass? And he goes, oh, didn't I say that? Yeah, you guys passed. And it was like. Wow. Okay. And I went out there and I said, you were scared of this guy. This guy was a, was a pussy cat. He, you know, I said, he let you get away with a lot. I was impressed. I'd never seen a check ride like that where somebody got away with so much and didn't fail. Maybe it was the fact that, uh, he had six months to go. Um, I don't know, but it, it was a rather, uh, stressful check ride. And I was sure that we had busted. Thanks for watching.